Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to introduce Unit 4 of the course on nonlinear equations and optimization. We're going to look at a few examples, and we'll introduce some definitions and concepts that we'll make use of in subsequent videos. So far in the course, we've mainly focused on linear phenomena. For example, in Unit 1 on data fitting, we showed that polynomial interpolation could be solved by inverting linear systems. When we looked at linear least squares problems, we found that it led to the normal equations, which were again a linear system that we could solve. We also introduced several linear physical models, such as Ohm's law, Hooke's law, and the Lontief equations. And when we looked at finite difference discretizations of linear PDEs, we found that those led to linear algebraic systems to solve. Of course, nonlinear models arise all the time as well. And we already looked briefly at this when we examined nonlinear least squares, and we looked at the Gauss-Newton and leverberg marquardt algorithms to solve these systems. And there are countless numbers of nonlinear physical models that arise. And a good example of this is in materials modeling. And suppose we take a material and extend it by an amount x. Then Hooke's law tells us that over a certain range of x, the force generated by that material will be linearly proportional to x. However, if we extend our material further, then often that linear relationship will break down and we will have a nonlinear response. In fact, many real world phenomena are inherently nonlinear. And when we write down linear models, often what we are doing is performing first order Taylor series expansions of the underlying nonlinear system. And the linear model is often valid in the case when those higher order terms in our Taylor series are small in comparison to the linear term. If we look at finite difference discretizations of nonlinear PDEs, then they typically would lead to nonlinear algebraic systems to solve. Another example of a nonlinear system that connects to previous course material is in the computation of the Gauss quadrature points and weights. And in Unit 3 of the course, we showed that we could determine these via mathematical considerations, and we found that our quadrature points were the roots of a Legendre polynomial. However, we could also try and find these points and weights directly via solving a linear system of equations for the xi and the wi. And for example, if we look at n equal 2, then we want to find points and weights that will integrate polynomials up to degree 3 exactly. So therefore, our quadrature scheme should integrate the monomials 1, x, x squared, and x cubed exactly. And if we consider each one of these monomials, then it will give us a nonlinear equation for the xi and wi that needs to be satisfied. And we would therefore have four nonlinear equations to solve for these four unknowns. We usually write a nonlinear system of equations as capital F of x is equal to zero, where f is a function from r to the n to r to the m. And we can implicitly absorb the right-hand side of this equation into the function f. And therefore, solving a nonlinear system of equations can always be simplified to finding a root of this function f of this form. And in this unit, we're going to focus on the case where m is equal to n. And if m was greater than n, then that would lead to nonlinear least squares that we briefly looked at before. And we're very familiar with scalar nonlinear equations where m is equal to 1. And perhaps the simplest case would be the quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to 0. And in this case, we can write down a closed form solution. We have the quadratic formula that tells us that x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. And in fact, there are closed form solutions for cubic and quartic equations 
that are due to Ferrari and Cardano and have been known for many centuries. But there's a very interesting and surprising mathematical fact that there is no general closed form solution for any polynomial of fifth order or higher. Hence, even for the simplest possible case of polynomials, the only hope is to employ a numerical method and typically an iterative approach that will converge to a solution as the number of iterations n tends to infinity. And ideally, for a good method, we'd like to have an accurate approximation to our solution after a few iterations. There are many well-known iterative methods for solving nonlinear equations, and perhaps the simplest is the bisection method for solving the scalar equation f of x equals zero, where f is a continuous function on the interval from a to b. And we'll now take a look at a Python example, bisection.py, that implements this method. Let's now take a look at the program bisection.py that demonstrates the bisection method for root finding on a scalar function. And we're going to find a root of the function f of x, which is equal to x squared minus 4 sine x, over the interval from 1 to 3. And if we plot this function, then we see that f of 1 is negative and f of 3 is positive. And the bisection method works by using the continuity of f. And if we know that we have an interval over which f switches sine, then it must contain at least one root. And indeed for this function, we see that there is a root roughly around x equal 1.9. If we look at our program, we first define our function that we're going to consider to be f of x, and we then define an initial interval from a to b, and we assume that f of a is less than zero and f of b is greater than zero. And here we're just saying a equal one and b equal three to match the range that we're considering. And we then perform the bisection search. We calculate the midpoint c between a and b, and we evaluate f there. So on our first iteration, c will be equal to two. And we can see then that if f of c is less than zero, then we must have a root between c and the upper interval limit of b. And if f of c is greater than zero, then we must have a root between a and c. And in both cases, we're therefore able to halve the size of our interval that contains our root. And in the program, we then redefine either a or b to be equal to c in order to do this. We keep on repeating this procedure until the size of our interval falls below some tolerance. And here I'm using the value of 10 to the minus 8. And we'll finally print out an estimate for the root to be the midpoint of the final interval. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And if we look at the first few steps that this program took, we started with the interval from 1 to 3, and then we bisected it to the interval from 1 to 2, and that's because f of 2 is positive, and therefore we know that our root must be between 1 and 2. On the next step, we would evaluate f at 1.5, and we see here that f is negative at 1.5, and that would allow us to halve our interval to 1.5 to 2. And we repeat this procedure, and we can see that the values of the lower and upper limits become closer and closer, and we end up with a good estimate at the end of this program for our root at 1.93375. So let me now rerun this program and output the results to a text file that we can plot in GNU plot. So I'm now going to overlay the positions of the lower and upper limits that were used during the bisection search. So the lower limits are shown in magenta triangles and the upper limits are shown in red circles and we see that there is a initial magenta triangle at 1 and an initial 
red circle at 3 corresponding to our starting interval and then as we progress in our bisection search these limits hone in on the position of our root. An important question is to ask how many iterations we would need in order to find our solution to a given tolerance and to do this we can ask what is the size of our interval after we've taken k steps and suppose we wanted to reach a tolerance level epsilon then we could see that we will want b minus a times 2 to the minus k to be approximately equal to epsilon and therefore we would require that k is approximately equal to log 2 of b minus a divided by epsilon and therefore we see that the number of steps required scales logarithmically with the accuracy level and this is good performance that can be quite practical in some cases. Bisection is a robust root finding method in one dimension. It has the advantage that if we have a continuous function f and we know that f is negative at one point and f is positive at another point then bisection is guaranteed to find a root. However, bisection doesn't generalize easily to two or more dimensions. In addition, bisection is rather crude since it only relies on the sign of the function evaluation and it doesn't incorporate any information about the magnitude of that function evaluation. In this unit, we're going to look at the mathematical basis for several alternative methods that will generalize more easily to n dimensions. We're going to look at the fixed point iteration and also at Newton's method. And in some cases, we'll see that these methods can give us better convergence than the bisection method. Another major topic in scientific computing is optimization. And this emerges in all kinds of different areas in science, engineering, industry, finance, economics, logistics, and so on. And many engineering challenges can be formulated as optimization problems. For example, if we were designing a racing car, then we might want to design the car body to maximize downforce. If we were designing a bridge, then we might want to minimize the weight of the bridge structure. And of course, in practice, it's more realistic to consider optimization problems with constraints. So we might want to design our car body to maximize downforce, but having a constraint on drag. We might want to design our bridge to minimize weight but having a constraint on strength. In addition, optimization problems, both constrained and unconstrained, emerge naturally in science and many physical systems will naturally occupy a minimum energy state and therefore if we can describe the energy of our system mathematically then we can find that minimum energy state via optimization. Recently, there have been a number of efforts to apply techniques from scientific computing to understand biological phenomena quantitatively using optimization. And we could use computational optimization to study phenomena such as fish swimming or insect flight. And in those studies, we can often reproduce the behavior that we can see in nature. And this gels with the idea that evolution has been optimizing aspects of organisms via natural selection over millions of years. An excellent example in this area is the work of Marcus Roper, Rachel Pepper, Michael Brenner and Anne Pringle, where they study the shapes of spores for Ascomycete fungi. And when these fungi release spores, they are explosively ejected from fruiting bodies and they have to pass through a thin layer of stagnant air surrounding the fungus in order to be carried away by the wind. And as the spores pass through this layer that's several millimeters thick, the aerodynamic drag that they experience is a substantial factor. And in this study, the authors first use optimization methods to predict the shape of an object that would minimize drag. And they then showed that for a number of different spores, the shapes closely matched this prediction from optimization. 
So optimization can be a powerful tool in biology. However, it's worth noting that in some cases, it can be very complicated to match evolution to optimization. If we think about natural selection and the success or failure of one particular organism, that can be a very complicated function of many aspects of how it interacts with its environment. And we may frequently see forms in biology that are simply good enough for a particular purpose. However, as this study shows, sometimes certain aspects of living organisms can be well explained through optimization. All these problems can be formulated in the following way. We want to optimize, i.e. maximize or minimize, an objective function over a set of feasible choices. And mathematically, we can define this as follows. Given an objective function, f from rn to r, and a set s contained within rn, we want to find an x star in s such that f of x star is less than or equal to f of x for all x in s. And it suffices to consider only minimization since maximization is equivalent to minimizing minus f. And we call s the feasible set and that is usually defined by a set of equations and or inequalities which are referred to as the constraints. And if s is just equal to rn, then the problem is unconstrained. And the standard way to write an optimization problem is to say that we want to minimize f of x for x in our feasible set s, subject to constraints g of x is equal to zero, and inequalities h of x is less than or equal to zero. And here, f is a function from rn to r, g is a function from rn to rm, and h is a function from rn to rp. As an example, let x1 and x2 be the radius and height of a cylinder respectively. And we might want to minimize the surface area of this cylinder, subject to a constraint on its volume. And therefore, we want to minimize the function f of x1 and x2 that's equal to 2 times pi times x1 times x1 plus x2, subject to the constraint that g of x1 and x2, which is equal to pi times x1 squared times x2 minus v, is equal to zero, where v is the volume of the cylinder. And we'll return to this example in this unit, and we'll show how we can solve this using Lagrange multipliers. If f, g, and h are all affine, then we call our optimization problem a linear program. And here, the term program has nothing to do with computer program, but instead refers to logistics and planning. And we call a function q of x affine if it can be written as a times x plus b for some matrix A and some vector b. And therefore, q is linear plus a constant. And linear programs emerge in many different fields and are particularly commonplace in the social sciences. And the affine structure of f, g, and h leads to some important simplifications in the solution of these problems. And we can show that the feasible region will form a convex polyhedron. And in general, our function f will have non-zero gradient everywhere, and therefore it can have no isolated local minima. Hence, the global minimum of our optimization problem will lie at a vertex of our convex polyhedron, defining the feasible set, and we can therefore make use of specialist algorithms that can check the vertices of this convex polyhedron. If the objective function or any of the constraints are nonlinear, then we have a nonlinear optimization problem or nonlinear program. And in this unit, we're going to look at several different approaches for nonlinear optimization. And optimization routines typically use local information about a function to iteratively approach a local minimum. And in some cases, this can easily give us a global minimum. So for example, if we look at this parabola and we apply our optimization approach, then we might iteratively find this local minimum, and that will indeed be the global minimum in this case. 
However, for more complicated functions, that might not be true. And if we look at this function, then we could imagine that our local optimization routine could get stuck in one of the many local minima that is not the global minimum. And it's worth noting that for a completely general function, global optimization is extremely difficult. And to demonstrate this, let's look at this function where we have a broad local minimum and then an isolated feature where we achieve the global minimum. And we can imagine that our iterative optimization approach might take several samples of our function and completely miss this global minimum. And it would be very difficult for our optimization approach to detect that other than making a very large number of samples of our function. So even in one dimension, finding global minima can be difficult. And if we move to many dimensions, then the problem can become even harder. And here I'm showing an example of a two-dimensional function. And we're looking at contours of this function. And here we could have a whole array of local minima. There are robust methods of finding local minima. And these are the main focus of AM205. Of course, global optimization is very important in practice, but as demonstrated, it can be difficult to guarantee that we've found a global minimum. Sometimes, if we're able to place certain constraints on our objective function, then that can allow us to ensure that we have found a global minimum. And there are also a number of techniques that we can use that often rely on heuristics or stochastic sampling that can more reliably find global minima. And some examples are multi-start methods where we apply local optimization techniques but from many different initial starting points, simulated annealing, and genetic algorithms. And we're not going to look at these in detail in AM205, but if you're interested in these, there is another course, Harvard AM207, where a number of these topics are covered in more detail.